and welcome to another lecture video for ecology. Today we're going to talk about parasitism and mutualism and because I dropped the ball and I included my parasite pin collection in a previous video, that was a mistake, I should have put it in this one, I decided to wear the mascot costume hat that I wear when I am Steel City Roller Derby's mascot derby for this lecture video because bees are in a mutualistic relationship with the plants they pollinate. Also, I figured out that QuickTime has a movie recording feature so now you don't have to see uh, how late I record all these lecture videos in the timestamp. I will tell you it just hit the stroke of midnight and is now Friday but yes it's late but the only reason I can record a video lecture this late is because y'all know I love parasites and you know I love pollinators two peas so let's do it let's talk about the greatest organisms on earth parasites Pollinators. Here's some nice corn smut fungus to start us off talking about parasitism and mutualism. Now, if this were a normal semester, I would have brought uh, this stuff for, to class for you to eat because it's a culinary delicacy and it's freaking delicious. It's uh, got many names, uh, corn truffle, corn smut, corn fungus. Uh, the name for it in Mexico is huitlacoque, and you can buy it canned. Uh, I've never had it fresh. I bet it tastes really good. It's got like a delicious smoky flavor, and I really love it. It tastes good in salsa. Um, anyway, you should try it sometime. Maybe... Uh, when the pandemic's over, I'll have just like a tasting party for ecology alumni of all this food I would have fed to you this semester. Anyway, it's a parasite on corn. Let's go! Okay, so, parasites. You know already that they draw resources from their host organisms. There are two main categories of parasites. There are microparasites in macroparasites, and they are essentially what you think those terms probably mean. Um, microparasites complete a full life cycle in one host, um, and they multiply in their definitive host. And surprise, they're small, they're teeny tiny. They have short generation times, in com very short generation times in comparison to their host. Uh, and this includes things like viruses. Oh, who? Who's that? The one that's just dictating how the whole world works right now. That's coronavirus. Um, also include viruses, bacteria. Um, this is an SEM picture of Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, specifically, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, which... Um, scared the crap out of me and my family earlier this year because my dad caught it in a hospital. It's really common in hospitals. It's a parasite. And funguses also fall in this category. So viruses, bacteria, and fungi. On the other hand, you have macroparasites. They do not multiply in their definitive final host. Uh, and as the name implies, they're bigger. Um, infections of macroparasites tend to be chronic and they tend to accumulate slowly uh, in comparison to microparasites. And the hosts usually don't develop immunity to macroparasites. Um, hosts can and do uh, develop immunity to uh, viruses, um, some bacterial infections, it depends. Um, but not with macros. Uh, these are just two of my favorite. I think I have a pen of this one. This is an isopod, a marine isopod that eats the tongues of fish. And it uses like a numbing agent so they don't know their tongue's been replaced with this dude. 
and then it sits inside their mouth and eats all their food that comes in through their mouth and it doesn't know that its tongue's been replaced by a crustacean. And then um, this is a sheep kid. It's a, a hippobosid. It's a wingless fly that has evolved like very uh, reduced flattened parasite features because it just lives on these gross skin flaps uh, on the butts of sheep. I learned about them in grad school in my taxonomy course and I thought they were really disgusting and cool. That's a sheep kid. It's a fly parasite. Okay, so um, you can also have hemiparasites and holoparasites. Hemiparasites are um, photosynthetic plants that contain chlorophyll when the plant is mature, and they, but they obtain, uh, so they're photosynthesizing to obtain nutrients and energy, but they also obtain water and other nutrients from water through the xylem of their host. So they are partially parasitic, partially photosynthetic. Here are two of examples, uh, one which I really love. This is mistletoe right here. Fun fact, that thing that everybody talks about during the holidays is a parasite on trees. Uh, so they derive nutrition from the xylem of their host plant, but they are also, they're green and they're photosynthetic and this is their fruit. So mistletoe is a hemiparasite. This is another one I really love. This is um, my favorite genus of flowers. It's Pedicularis. Uh, lousewort is the common name. Um, and it's a fitting name because they parasitize the roots of plants. But they're green, obviously, so they, fo they do photosynthesize a little bit. I like Pedicularis because bumblebees have a really cool evolutionary history with Pedicularis and the evolutionary patterns of spread and diversification of Pedicularis species seems to match really closely to this the dispersal and evolutionary history and diversification of bumblebee species so they're kind of like sort of kind of co-evolved together and they're like very pretty flowers so Pedicularis, lousewort, hemiparasite, mistletoe, hemiparasite. Um, then you can also have holoparasites. A holoparasite, in, in terms of plants, um, are plants that do not have any chlorophyll. They don't photosynthesize, so they obtain all of their nutrition from the host that they are parasitizing off of. And these are just a few really cool examples. I first came in contact with this one when I was doing field work in the Sierra Nevada. This is Dodder, D-O-D-D-E-R. Um, and it's this really strange plant that uh, just kind of grows on top of grasses. Uh, well, this isn't a grass. This looks like some sort of coastal plant here based on the morphology. This looks like seagrass or something. But it grows on top of like low-laying vegetation. Uh, and then just sucks all the nutrients out of it. It's got a really weird stringy texture. Um, I like it. I think it's cool because I love parasites. This is um, ghost plant. You can find these locally in Pennsylvania. Um, they're also complete parasites. They're white. They don't have any chlorophyll. Uh, this is a s sort of similar plant. I think they might be in the same family called snow plant. Uh, it's called snow plant because you can they pop up when there's still snow on the ground. So it's like these really beautiful pops of red in a field of snow. And then this plant, which we've talked about before, this corpse flower. I think we talked about it when we were talking about fly pollination. Uh, it is a holoparasite of vines. Oh, and snow plant actually is not is a parasite of fung fungi that live in the soil primarily. Uh, this is a parasite of vines, woody tree vines. So, cool parasitic plants. I bet a lot of you didn't know that plants were parasites. Um, and the hosts that these parasites live on can provide really diverse habitats for the parasites. So, um, 
You can have parasites that live outside of the host, on the outside of that host. Those are called ectoparasites. Here's two human examples uh, that show the diversity of habitats. So external environments, it, like let's think about the human as a uh, habitat for a parasite. The external environment of a human has airflow, high oxygen content. Uh, most of the things that live on the outside of us feed on uh, are, uh, well, they, well, you have like these eyebrow mites that eat like your dense skin flakes. Uh, we can harvest them. Well, if you take invertebrate zoology, we'll do a lab where we try to harvest the mites out of your eyebrows. Um, you will have various things that live on your skin and your sebaceous oils. Uh, and then there's various blood feeding parasites that live on the outside. So things like lice, I'm sure you've all had these as a kid. Um, and then you can have endoparasites. Uh, I believe this is schistosoma. Uh, it's a internal parasite of humans. So inside the body of a human, you've got very warm environments. So pretty constant body temperature. So that's very hospitable. Um, high water availability. Um, don't have to worry so much about desiccation on the inside of the body. And so you have a different morphology for internal parasites of a human, for example, versus external parasites. Um, now let's talk a little bit about how parasites spread. Um, you can have a direct transmission of parasites, which is from one host, they jump or fly through aerosolized droplets from one host to the other host. Uh, there's nothing in between. So, um, I actually had this picture of a coronavirus in this slide before, from last year, before the pandemic hit. Uh, but viruses are a perfect example of direct transmission. A lot of human viruses um, give you symptoms that increase their spread. So the re part of the reason that um, a lot of viruses still uh, cause symptoms of like a runny nose um, and a cough, part of the reason a lot of viruses have this um, suite of symptoms is not only because of how your immune response, your immune system reacts to it, but also like there's an evolutionary advantage to spread to making this happen in your host because then it increases your spread and increases your chances of reproduction. So like if you're coughing and sneezing all the time, you're constantly um, emitting particles of that parasite out into the air so that they can be infect a new host. And so it's, there's an evolutionary advantage to micro parasites, especially causing runny noses and sneezing and coughing, uh, because it helps them spread and reproduce. Um, so that's direct transmission is just one host directly onto another host. Um, on the other hand, you can have some parasites that spread through an intermediate vector. Um, so, for example, Borrelia burgdorferi, Borg, burgdorfer, uh, burgdorferi? It's got to be named after somebody. The spirochete parasite that causes Lyme disease um, relies on ticks as an intermediate vector. So... Um, they actually, like, their their main hosts are things like squirrels, lizards, burbs, people, doggos. Um, those are the hosts, but they have an intermediate vector, so they're carried by a tick. So anything that's an arthropod-borne disease, generally that arthropod is not the host. It's an intermediate vector, so malaria is another example of something with an intermediate vector. Um, you can also have um, each pair, like all parasites have something called a definitive host. So some parasites never leave 
and they just have one species that they infect. But others, um, and so, you know, the main host is the definitive host. Um, but other species of parasites will have multiple different species that they live inside of. And so the definitive host is the host in which the parasite undergoes sexual maturity and sexual reproduction. So what I've included here, um, the CDC has really awesome infographics for lots of different species of parasites that affect humans. So here, taking you back to GenBio, is an infographic of um, Plasmodium falciparum, which is the Plasmodium parasite that causes malaria. So the mosquitoes are the definitive host for the malaria parasite um, because this is the host that they reproduce in. Um, so this is them going through their reproductive life cycle within the mosquito. Um, so they pick it up by ingesting gametocytes from a blood meal uh, from a human. And then uh, once they, once the plasmodium reproduces inside the mosquito, then if that mosquito, female mosquito, bites another uh, human, it injects the sporozoites into the human, and then they go through um, separate non-reproductive parts of their life cycle within the human host. Now, we all know from getting a cold uh, or any kind of infection that hosts respond to their parasites. Um, here, I am showing you six different versions of how an oak tree responds to a parasitic being parasitically infected with, um, I'm pretty sure all of these are galls that are in Produced by wasps. This one might actually be a fungus, but this is how six different ways that oak trees respond to be infected by parasites. Um, for the ones that I'm pretty sure, I, I'm not sure if this is insect or fungus, but at least for the other five, uh, it's an insect that it, an egg is laying in the tissue and then the larvae eats the tissue and what the the larva produces oak growth regulators in their saliva that then induce the plant to form this gall. And so part of it is kind of like an immune defense from the plant, but also part of it is um, an induced response caused by the parasite. Um, so this is just six different ways that oaks respond to being infected. And parasites can also affect um, these, obviously we know that parasites can affect the survival of their host and they can also affect their reproduction. Um, in this graph here, this is from your textbook. Um, this is infection of California killifish by a trematode parasite. Um, and what the trematode parasite does is it causes an abnormal behavior that increases the susceptibility of the individuals to predation. So, um, they engage in more conspicuous and risky behaviors um, when they're infected with a trematode rather than uninfected. That behavior then it causes them to um, get eaten more by predators. Um, and that might be an evolutionary advantage for the trematode, but obviously that's going to alter the reproduction of the killifish population. So you can also see Oh, yeah, look, this is the, the predator here, or birds. Um, you can see that um, there's even levels of infection. So highly infected individuals uh, engage in these very conspicuous behaviors and get eaten a lot. Um, this, gra this picture that I have here, um, Graham will recognize this because that's Nosema. Nosema is a microsporidian parasite of bumblebees uh, that infects their guts and... Oh, yeah, you know this because I told you about it the first, very first lecture. Basically, when it infects their guts, a um, uh, friend and collaborator of mine, Jamie Strange, found that Nosema, when it infects males, um, if they have a really heavy infection load in their guts, 
it can make their abdomen so bloated and swollen that they're not able to curve them around for mating with females. So you can see this is like the typical mating posture of bumblebees. This is Bombus lapidarius, which is a European species, but this is basically the posture all species have where the male like stands at the back and then has to curve his abdomen to inseminate the queen. Um, if they're very heavily infected with nosema, they're basically their butts get so full that they can't form this curvature that allows them to mate. It's really sad. Um, parasites can also regulate the populations of their hosts. Um, they can function as density dependent regulators. Um, so uh, at high densities, they will have higher uh, spread rates and higher infection rates. Um, two examples of this are distemper in raccoons and rabies in foxes. This is not a raccoon with distemper because that's a picture of me feeding it. Um, these are pictures I took in 2016 when I visited my friend in South Korea and we went to a raccoon cafe in Seoul and they had this like pen where two raccoons lived and you could like feed them granola and pet them. They were very cute. This one doesn't have distemper though, which is a density dependent regulator of raccoon populations. Um, parasites can also function as a selective agent um, by inducing mortality on only certain subsets of populations. So we've talked about like, you know, age structure and populations before. Sometimes parasites will only infect certain ages um, of individuals in a population and then that might ultimately act as a selective agent on that population. So in one example they talk about in your book are lungworms that cause pneumonia only in the lambs of bighorn sheep and so it's acting as a selective agent on juveniles in that population. Um, but sometimes parasitism can turn into a mutualism. Um, and probably the coolest evidence or the, the most um, robust evidence for parasitism evolving into mutualism comes from this thing. This is Wolbachia. It is a um, parasite of insects. And I have a few friends that work on Wolbachia. Um, and there's this theory that vertically transmitted parasites, um, which is from uh, mother to offspring, are selected to increase host survival and reproduction um, because when they maximize the host reproductive success, that benefits the paras parasite and the host. So we're talking specifically about parasites that rely on transmission from the mother to the young they need that mother to reproduce, and so they need to increase their reproductive potential. So if they're increasing their reproductive potential, they can eventually also become a mutualist. Um, so there's evidence for this in Wolbachia in um, female Nasonia wasp, which actually happen to be parasites themselves. That's one injecting its eggs into a cockroach. Uutheca, I think. And then uh, Drosophila, they both uh, can be infected by Wolbachia, and there's evidence from both of these that um, females that are infected of Nasonia and, and wild populations of Drosophila actually produce more offspring than non-infected individuals, which is really cool. So that brings us now to mutualisms the friendly side of species interactions. Um, here's just a few really cool examples that I like. You got your, you know, classic lichen. Lichen is a mutualistic relationship between fungi and either an algae or a cyanobacteria, something that photosynthesizes. That's a real pretty one right there. Um, these are some pollinator examples. These are, uh, Eukaryotes that live inside the guts of termites, we'll talk about them more in a second. Um, with mutualistic relationships, you can have specialists and you can have generalists. 
Specialists are um, species that feed on only one kind uh, or have only, it's a one-to-one -one relationship. So specialist mutualist is a one-to-one -one relationship. So uh, these endosymbionts only live inside the guts of certain termite species. And then this is one of my favorite specialist pollinator mutualisms. This is the yucca moth pollinating the yucca flower. So yucca moths have really, um, have, have a long evolutionary history of evolving with their yucca host plants. If you guys have ever heard of Joshua trees, um, they're pollinated, they're a type of yucca and they're pollinated by yucca moths. Um, they lay their eggs inside of the, no, I might get this wrong. They lay their eggs inside the ovary of the yucca plant and they engage in this behavior that's really wild where they collect, they do not eat the pollen of the plant, but they will collect a ball of pollen from a flower and and just engage in a pollination behavior. They collect the ball and they pollinate the flower themselves, which is really different from most pollinators where they drink the nectar from the flower um, or they eat the pollen and so they get something out of actually pollinating the plant. The yucca moth doesn't actually get anything out of pollinating this plant besides the fruit developing and being able to lay their eggs inside of it, which is really weird and cool. Um, on the other hand, you can have generalist pollinators. Um, these are, or sorry, generalist uh, mutualists, which are organisms that have mutualistic relationships with more than one other species. Um, alfalfa leafcutter bees, for example, um, they'll feed on lots of different species of plants and they'll make their nests. Well, that's not a really a mutualistic relationship. That's more just herbivory, but the plants that they pollinate are more than just alfalfa. They'll visit other flowers, um, as well. Um, here's a really cool example that's in your textbook that I thought I would mention. Um, these are, and I'm sure I, you probably hear about these in gen bio, I think. This is um, symbiotic zoanthellae, which are these dinoflagellates that live inside of corals. And um, during the day, when they're sunlight, they're photosynthetic, um, they provide their host with um, the carbon products of photosynthesis. And sometimes they can provide up to 90% of the energy that the host actually needs for metabolism. And in return, they receive uh, nutrients, carbon dioxide, um, and the structure, the actual physical structure of the coral provides them access to sunlight. Um, so zoanthellae are really cool. Here is a picture of a, a red sea whip, which is a type of coral, which is an animal, even though it looks like a plant. Uh, it's a type of coral that I have living in my aquarium at home. Um, and these are the tiny little, they're filter feeders. These are the little filter feeding structures, but this is a coral. It's also photosynthetic. Um, and this just happens to be a tiny little sea slug that appeared in the tank that um, is kind of like a parasite on this red sea whip. Um, they didn't last very long, but uh, I very much enjoyed them while they were around. Anyway, this coral has zoanthellae inside of it, and it's in my house. Um, a lot of mutualisms revolve around a nutritional exchange, so um, let's just talk about a couple examples here. I already mentioned these termite gut endosymbionts. These are the endosymbionts that are in their gut. The, um, they're eukaryotes that produce cellulase enzymes. If you know anything about termites, you know that they eat wood. The only reason they are able to eat and receive nutrition from wood is because these endosymbionts produce cellulase and make that release nutrition from that very highly indigestible material so that they can receive nutrition from it. And then in return, obviously, the endosymbionts get the food from the termites eating it and a place to live. Another one that you learn about in gem bio are these rhizobium root nodules. Um, rhizobia are bacteria that colonize plant cells within um, the root nodules. 
Um, and what they do is they convert atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia um, using nitrogenase. And then um, they also provide organic nitrogen compounds to the plant. Um, and the plant provides housing for them. So rhizobium help plants um, release energy from the other the environment that they otherwise wouldn't be able to utilize for nutrition. You can also have defensive mutualisms, which are super, super cool. We've already talked about these. Um, you also learn about them in Gen Bio. This is um, acacia ants. The acacia thorns are hollow and provide a housing for the ants. They also produce these things called extra floral nectaries that provide nutrition for the plant. And in return, ants defend the acacia from herbivores um, that might attack it. Um, a lot of ants, ants have most of the examples I can think of for defensive mutualisms. Um, a lot of ants will basically tend scale insects like little, little, little herders, like their little cattle, um, because they eat the sticky secretions that they poop out. So scale insects, like we've talked about before, tend to be um, phloem feeders, um, which is liquid. And so they're constantly pooping out this very concentrated sugary syrup. Um, ants like that sugary syrup. And so they will tend and protect, sometimes they will tend and protect herbivores, scale insects that live on plants. Um, and so by way of this behavior and this like farming behavior, they become crop pests particularly if those scale insects are affecting something that we eat. So uh, I knew a lot of people at the University of California Riverside that were studying this interaction between these Argentine ants, which are an invasive species in California, and their tending behavior of citrus scale insects because um, that makes them a huge pest of citrus crops in California. And now we're going to talk about pollinators. So usually in pollination... Uh, relationships, uh, well, kind of besides the yucca moth and also a little bit besides the fig wasp, um, the pollinator receives nutrition via pollen or nectar from the plant, and then the plant in turn gets pollinated. I just thought I'd show you two of my favorites. I just already talked about the yucca moth pollination, which is one of my favorite mechanisms just because it's got such a strong co-evolutionary relationship between the moth and the flower. Um, you may not know, fun fact, that chocolate is actually pollinated by flies. Um, they, I, these are not cacao midges, but, um, I couldn't find some great, I couldn't find very good pictures. These are just midges that are in the same family, but they kind of look like this. These are the flies that pollinate chocolate. Um, so chocolate flowers kind of smell bad. <laughs> um, and when they, uh, cho so chocolate is native to... Uh, Mesoamerica, but the colonists brought it over to Africa to grow it there, and it wasn't growing. And what they realized is that uh, it was missing the habitat for these cacao midges, which was leaf litter and decaying leaf material on the bottom of the floor. And so they started building artificial leaf material and bringing over dead, decaying leaf material that had these midge larvae in it uh, to pollinate cacao crops. And then, of course, you already know about this from exam two. Um, these are fig wasps. So cool. Such a really interesting co-evolutionary relationship. And um, there's a whole documentary about the food webs and co-evolutionary relationships that revolve around figs called Queen of the Trees. And I put on Schoology a little clip from uh, that documentary about it that talks about this fig wasp relationship. Um, these are the eyeless wingless males that don't even leave the fig that they're born inside of. It's just like really cool. I love this example of mutualism. Also, if you're wondering, a lot of, like, if you like eating figs like I do, a lot of figs are now, have been bred to self-fertilize and so they don't they're not they don't need these wasp pollinators but the ones that do 
The wasp is actually digested by enzymes in the fig, so you're not eating a wasp when you eat a fig. Just FYI. Um, there's also some really cool mutualistic rela relationships involved in seed dispersal. Um, I'm going to just talk about two of my favorite examples here. Um, I want to talk about the mistletoe bird partly because we already talked about mistletoe, but uh, and also I, th I think it's kind of funny. So uh, mistletoe relies on moving on to new host trees by being eaten by birds. This is a mistletoe bird. Uh, and when the what it does is that it actually makes the birds poop really sticky. And so they get like a poopy butt. And then because it sticks, that's actually a bird wiping its butt on a tree branch. Because it sticks to their butt, they have to wipe their butt to get the poop off. And that ensures that their seeds that are pooped out by the birds get deposited onto a tree which they can then parasitize so they basically give birds poopy butts on purpose so they wipe their butts on trees um these are really cool things called um mermeco cores so um this is when plants use ants to disperse their seeds and the way in which they do that is through something called an oliosome so it's a food body that is attached to the coat of a seed that provides nutrition to the ant um, and it is produced only to provide nutrition to ants so that the ants carry the seeds around. They eat this little liosome and then they disperse the seed by way of receiving that nutrition, which is super cool. So if you think about the strength of these relationships and um, the uh, mechanisms that are involved in these mutualisms and these parasitisms. Um, you could also think about how at the population level, if um, one change in a population level of one of the individuals involved in this interaction changes, it might influence um, the other species involved. So um, I want you to think a little bit about what are some of the consequences of the mutualisms at the population level, just for this system, thinking about mistletoe bird and mistletoe. So if you think about mistletoe bird and mistletoe, what might happen if there's a decline in the mistletoe bird? You might also see a decline in mistletoe if it's missing its main seed disperser, right? Um, mistletoe bird, um, if it is a specialist and only eats mistletoe berries, um, then if there's a decline in mistletoe, you might in turn see a resulting decline in mistletoe birds if they only eat it. But if that bird happens to be a generalist and will eat other berries, you may not see a decline in mistletoe bird with a decline in mistletoe if they have something else that they feed on. So these are just some things that I want you to think about um, and be prepared to think about um, and answer questions about for the exam. So that ends this chapter on parasitism and mutualism. Tune in next time for community structure. Bye-bye.